Hello. Today, le today's lecture will address the behavioral objectives for week two. This is the part B portion of the lecture. So this is week two content in our syllabus, but this is the part B portion. Remember how I, I said earlier that the file is so large, it is necessary to make it in two parts. So I hope you've watched part A already. This follows directly from part A. So as I mentioned earlier, the guidelines used to prepare infants and children for procedures can be divided into general and then they're a little bit more specifically listed in a table in your textbook and we're going to highlight some of them now. So for an infant when there's going to be a procedure, involve the parent if the parent wants to be involved. Uh, have the usual caregivers perform or assist with the procedure. Limit the number of strangers entering the room during the procedure. This can be explained to nursing students, letting them know that sometimes we can't let you watch a procedure because it's not in the best interest of the patient. It's not that we don't want you there. So it is necessary sometimes to limit the number of people that's going into a room during a procedure. Using analgesics um, and using other soothing measures like stroking the skin, talking softly, and giving a pacifier. Uh, keeping frightening objects out of view until you're going to be utilizing them. Like if you're gonna give somebody, unfortunately, an injection, keeping that behind your back. Perform painful procedures in a separate room, typically a treatment room. We don't wanna do this in the crib or their bed. We wanna keep that as uh, a safe space as much as possible. Use non-intrusive procedures whenever possible. With your toddler, remember that um, letting them know it's okay to cry and use and yell and use other means of um, expression so they can express their discomfort. Explain the procedure in relation to what they will see, hear, taste, smell, and feel. Um, know that they are going to resist. The child may try to run away. You need to be firm and direct um, and restrain them adequately. In terms of restraining, please make sure you've got enough people to restrain this child adequately. Again, keeping frightening objects out of you until you're going to use them. You want to give one direction at a time. Um, and you can even use small replicas of the equipment and let them play with it. They will be less fearful of it then. Uh, prepare the child shortly or right before the procedure is going to take place. And when you're going to be doing teaching with them, you want to keep the session short, only five to ten minutes. Um, please note that sometimes you may uh, be doing a procedure, maybe a Foley catheterization, you want to have extra equipment nearby uh, because you don't want any kind of delay. You want it uh, right there next to you in case you need a second one. Let the child know when the procedure is completed. Allow the child to have choices whenever possible, but note that they may still be resistant and negative. Allow the child to participate in the care whenever possible, like holding their cup or holding a dressing. A preschooler, explain procedures in simple terms and in relation to how it affects the child. Demonstrate use of equipment. Uh, allow the child to play with miniature or actual equipment. Use neutral words to describe the procedure, like medicine under the skin instead of a shot. You can say a special kind of sleep versus anesthesia a boo-boo versus pain. Know that they, because of their uh, concept of time, um, you may want to divide uh, information into uh, more than one session. Clarify why each procedure is performed. A child will find it difficult to understand how medicine 
can make him or her feel better and taste bad at the same time. State directly that procedures are never a form of punishment. This is why it's important for parents not to tell a child, if you don't do something, you're gonna, the nurse is gonna give you a shot. Very important not to do that kind of stuff. So remember, preschoolers have that uh, thought process of animism. So they do have fears of bodily harm, intrusion, and castration. So uh, please point out on a doll um, or a drawing um, what's going to be done to them and that no other body part will be involved. Try to be as non-intrusive as possible. Uh, apply adhesive bandages over puncture sites because sometimes children will believe that because they are bleeding that they're just going to bleed and bleed and bleed and without the band-aid um, that that's to preserve their body integrity so put band-aids on them again encourage parental presence and realize that procedures um, involving genitals can truly provoke a lot of anxiety allow the child to wear underpants when they have their gown on and at all times when it's possible involve the child in care whenever it possible give them, them choices avoid except try to procrastinate praise the child for helping and attempting to cooperate never shame the child for a lack of cooperation the school-aged child here you can you explain procedures using the correct scientific medical terminology explain the reason for the procedure using simple diagrams of anatomy and physiology explain function and operation of equipment in concrete terms allow the child to manipulate the equipment allow time before and after the procedure for questions and discussions here these kids can have longer teaching sessions and improve time and you can actually prepare them in advance of the procedure um, here they have an increase in self-control so it's a little bit easier to gain the child's cooperation tell the child what you want them to do and then suggest ways of maintaining control like deep breathing relaxing counting allow them responsibilities for simple tasks like collecting specimens when possible, include the child in the decision making. Maybe they can so choose a site for what's going to be done. Maybe letting them pick uh, where they can have their IV inserted or what time of day they can have their dressing change if it's only once a day. Encourage active participation, allowing them to remove dressings and handling equipment. And then also maybe uh, developing relationships with their peers. Uh, maybe you may be able to prepare two or more children for the same procedure at the same time and encourage each other to help one another. Provide privacy from peers during procedures to help maintain self-esteem. So although they may be together when they're being prepared for the procedure, you would not be doing the procedure with somebody else, uh, an other friend present. Adolescence. Here you want to supplement explanations with reasons why a procedure is necessary or beneficial. Explain long-term consequences of procedures. Uh, realize that adolescents may fear death, disability, and other potential risks. Encourage questions regarding fears, options, and alternatives. Provide privacy. Discuss how the procedure may affect their appearance and what can be done to minimize it. Emphasize any physical benefits of the procedure. Remember, adolescents are more concerned with the present than the future. Realize that the immediate effects of a procedure are much more important to them than the future benefits. Involve them in decision making and planning. Uh, impose as few restrictions as possible. Suggest methods of maintaining control. Accept regression to a more childish method of coping. This is not uncommon, even for an adolescent. 
realize that adolescents may have difficulty in accepting new authority figures and may resist complying with procedures. Uh, here, allow adolescents to talk with other adolescents who have had the same procedure. Please be sure to review all of the procedures in chapter 20. Uh, make sure that you understand the differences between children and adults. I'm going to highlight a few of the procedures here, but you are responsible for knowing the entire chapter. So let's talk a little bit about personal hygiene. This is dependent on age and development. You want to teach about appropriate self-care, safety, no electronic equipment next to water. Uh, ideally, the daily health habits should be the same way they are at home. Let the parents participate. As a nurse, you can get all of the equipment needed and then place a towel in the tub so that the child does not slip. Provide for oral care. Often oral care is neglected. Make sure that they are brushing their teeth at least twice a day. Wash hair and disentangle with a lubricant first. Hair often is also often missed. Safety. If the side rail is down or the isolate is open, you must keep your hand on the child at all times. By the way, that it goes for the parents as well. Restraints. You want to use the least amount of restraint to be effective. There's a, something called a mummy restraint um, where the child is basically, imagine, wrapped up like a mummy and you can utilize this type of restraint to treat something on the head, neck, and chest. You can use elbow restraints. Uh, this helps prevent scratching of the face or preserve facial plastic surgery, uh, such as if somebody had um, a cleft lip or cleft palate surgery. Um, it also can help prevent uh, if the child has an eye patch or a scalp vein from uh, touching those things. Um, note that a mummy restraint can also be utilized if you have one arm out uh, to start an IV. Uh, jacket restraints can be used to keep a child in their wheelchair um, or their high chair, although most high chairs now have, uh, they kind of look like seat belts. Um, arm and leg restraints, you may need to use these to immobilize one or more extremities. Uh, next, we'll talk a little bit about feeding techniques. If you are doing a tube feeding on a small child, the measurement is a little different than an adult. Here, you're gonna measure from the tip of the nose to the ear lobe to halfway between the xiphoid process and the umbilicus. So you're gonna notice it's a bit further than the adult. You wanna position them on the right side after eating because this helps to facilitate digestion. Bottle feed infants in an elevated position or use a bent bottle to decrease gas. So keep infants elevated as much as possible when you are feeding them. This also helps to prevent aspiration. And please do not prop bottles. Intake and output. So here, if a child is wearing a diaper, then you're gonna be weighing the diaper to see how much fluid is inside of it. You need to have a clean diaper as well when you're weighing the dirty diaper. What you will do is you will get a clean diaper, place it on the scale on top of a paper towel, and then you will zero the scale. Once the scale reads zero, then you will remove the clean diaper that is the same size as the dirty diaper, and then you're gonna put the dirty diaper on, and now you've got the number of milliliters that is in the diaper, and you've just determined what the urine output is. Uh, to apply a urine bag, you wanna clean the area, and on females, you wanna apply it on the perineum first. Make sure you've cleaned the area well, and it is very, very dry. Next, we will talk about poisoning. The emergency treatment associated with poisoning is, and this is a table in your text as well, we wanna assess the victim, initiate CPR if needed, Take your vital signs and then reevaluate routinely. Treat other symptoms such as seizures. Terminate the exposure comes next. 
empty the mouth of pills, plant parts, or other material. So if you see anything that is, that is in the mouth that's toxic, please remove it. Flush the ice continuously with normal saline. You can also use room temperature tap water if you're at home. You want to do this for 15 to 20 minutes. If it's on the skin, flush the skin and wash with soap and water and a soft cloth. Remove the contaminated clothes, especially if it's a pesticide, acid, alkali, or hydrocarbon is involved. Bring the victim of an inhalation poisoning into fresh air. Next, we want to identify the poison. Question the victim and witnesses. Look for environmental cues like an empty container, a nearby spill, or an odor on their breath. Also, save all evidence of the poison. So you may have, need to save the container that the poison was contained in. If the child vomited, we would want to save that, and even the urine. Be alert to signs and symptoms of potential poisoning in the absence of other evidence. Things like ocular or dermal exposure. You want to call the Poison Control Center or other competent emergency facilities for immediate advice regarding poisoning treatment. Next, we want to prevent poison absorption. You can place a child in a sideline sitting or a kneeling position with the head below the chest to prevent aspiration. You may administer activated charcoal with a cathartic if necessary. Typically, the usual dosage is one gram per kilogram. You would give this in a covered opaque or a cup that you cannot see through uh, and use a straw um, to decrease spilling. You may mix it in a little bit of juice or diet soda. You don't want to put charcoal with a lot of sugar because that will decrease its effectiveness. Active, activated charcoal sort of looks like a black slurry. That's the reason we want to put it in a cup that the child cannot see through. And then um, also, if there is an antidote, then we would want to give that obviously. Um, and it may even be necessary to insert a nasogastric tube to perform gastric lavage, or you may need a nasogastric tube um, to give some oral medications if the child is not willing to take it. Please be aware that many houseplants are poisonous. So let's get started with the different kinds of poisons. First of all is corrosives. These are strong acids or alkalis. These include drain cleaners, toilet cleaners, dishwasher detergents, mildew remover, batteries, and bleach. Clinical manifestations include severe burning pain in the mouth, throat, and stomach, white swollen mucous membranes, edema of the lips and tongue, violent vomiting, drooling and inability to clear secretions, signs of shock, anxiety and agitation. What are we going to do? What's the expected treatment? We do not induce vomiting. This is contraindicated because the vomiting will re-damage the mucosa. It damaged it going down. We don't want to re-damage it coming back up. Call the poison control. Dilute the corrosive with water or milk, usually no more than 120 milliliters if no help is available quickly. Do not neutralize. This can cause more injury. Provide a patent airway if necessary, other than what we just mentioned in terms of uh, diluting the corrosive. Don't allow any other oral intake and then give pain management. Hydrocarbons. These include gasoline, lighter fluid, paint thinner, turpentine, kerosene, lamp oil, and mineral seal oil, which is found in furniture polish. Clinical manifestations include gagging, choking, coughing, nausea, vomiting, weakness, lethargy. Respiratory symptoms of pulmonary involvement include tachypnea, cyanosis, retractions, and grunting. The immediate danger is aspiration. Even a small amount of aspirate can cause bronchitis and a chemical pneumonia. Treatment, no, it is a little bit controversial. Um, introducing emesis usually is contraindicated. Gastric de decontamination is also questionable, but know that if it is to be done, the child must have a cuffed ET tube in place to prevent aspiration. Provide support of treatment. 
if they have a chemical or develop a chemical pneumonia, they should be on high humidity, oxygen, hydration, IV antibiotics. Um, if this got on their skin and clothes, remove their clothes and wash their skin well with soap and water. Acetaminophen. This occurs in four stages. The initial stage of toxicity includes two, is uh, the initial period, it's called, it's two to four hours after ingestion. And here you would see nausea, vomiting, sweating, and pallor. The latent period is 24 to 36 hours. The patient looks a little bit better. Hepatic, hepatic involvement includes, this might actually last up to seven days and could be permanent. Here they would experience pain in the right upper quadrant, jaundice, confusion, stupor, and coagulation abnormalities. Patients that don't die during the hepatic stage usually will gradually recover. This is actually the most common drug poisoning in children. Typically a to toxic dose is 150 milligrams per kilogram. Tell parents to read medication labels. Treatment, the antidote of acetaminophen is N-acetylcysteine, also known as a concentrated mucomus. This can be given orally, um, but it must be diluted in some type of a fruit juice or soda because it has a very offensive odor. It smells like rot rotten eggs. Sometimes children won't drink it, and then we do need to put an NG tube down because they need multiple, multiple doses. Often you will give a loading dose and then followed by at least 17 maintenance doses, and then they'll be checking their labs. Aspirin toxicity. Clinical manifestations include acute poisoning like nausea, disorientation, vomiting, dehydration, diaphoresis, hyperpnea, hyperpexia, oliguria, tinnitus, coma, convulsions. For chronic poisoning, you could see some of the same symptoms above, but it's a little bit more subtle onset. So dehydration, coma, seizures, they can actually be more severe here, um, and they can have more bleeding tendencies. The treatment, they will be hospitalized for severe toxicity. They may use lavage, activated charcoal with or without a cathartic. Lavage will not remove concentrations of aspirin in the blood. Activated charcoal is important in early aspirin toxicity. Sodium bicarbonate transfusions are used to correct metabolic acidosis and urinary alkalization may be effective in enhancing elimination. This is often difficult to achieve. Watch for fluid overload and pulmonary edema. You may use external cooling measures, anticonvulsants, oxygen and ventilation support for respiratory depression, vitamin K for bleeding problems, and in severe cases, hemodialysis may be used. Iron toxicity. Iron, which we all know is a mineral supplement, or you may have a vitamin that is containing iron, um, can be toxic. Uh, clinical manifestations, these occur in five stages. The initial period lasts anywhere from one half hour to six hours after ingestion. Please note, if the child does not develop any GI symptoms in six hours, toxicity is unlikely. Vomiting, hematemesis, diarrhea, hematochesia, and gastric pain are part of that initial period. Latency, two to 12 hours, here the patient looks a little better. Stage three is systemic toxicity. This lasts anywhere from four to 24 hours after ingestion. Here we can see metabolic acidosis, fever, hyperglycemia, bleeding shock, and death may occur. Hepatic injury, 48 to 96 hours. Here you can see seizures and coma. And then quite a bit later, pyloric stenosis in stage five can result Typically, this would take two to five weeks. So it is something that needs to be monitored for once a patient goes home after iron toxicity. Treatment is emesis or lavage. Chelation therapy with deferoxamine and severe intoxications may be necessary. Please note that this uh, infusion may turn the urine a red to an orangish color. If IV deferoxamine is given too rapidly, the child may experience hypotension, facial flushing rash, uticaria, tachycardia, and shock may occur. 
If this does happen, stop the infusion, maintain the IV line with normal saline, and contact the physician immediately. Next, we're gonna talk about lead poisoning. This is not in the poisoning box in your textbook. This is separate from the table. So lead poisoning, this is a heavy metal that is poorly absorbed by the body and slowly excreted. Lead replaces calcium in the bones, increases the permeability of the central nervous system membranes. Most common sources of lead are lead paint, sanding lead paint, soil dust, water from lead pipes, using lead pans, and poorly fired ceramic pots, and in certain traditional remedies. One example of this is azurcone. Please look in your textbook for the multiple other traditional remedies that are high in lead. Lead paint was banned in 1978 for home use. Diagnosis. So there are no safe levels of lead in the blood. But to diagnosis, lead levels of 10 micrograms per deciliter on two successive blood draws is an issue. Lead levels should be checked at one and two years of age, and then any child who's not been tested between three and six years of age. Signs and symptoms, anemia, renal damage can result in glycosuria, proteinuria, ketonuria. There can also be a decrease in vitamin D and impaired calcium function. Effects on the nervous system include at a low dose exposure, distractibility, impulsivity, hyperactivity, hearing impairment, and mild intellectual deficits. At a high dose exposure, they can have a lead encephalopathy, psych uh, cognitive impairment, paralysis, blindness, seizures, coma, death. They can also develop a lead line, which is a blue-black line on the gum tissue. In general, they might experience vomiting, constipation, weight loss, abdominal cramping, cramping fatigue, lethargy, bone pain, and paresthesia. Lead levels between 5 and 44 micrograms per deciliter include monitoring, education, and environmental investigation. Chelation treatment occurs for levels of 45 micrograms per deciliter or more. Um, and within 48 hours to provide coordination of care and clinical management treatment, environmental investigation, and lead hazard control. The child cannot stay in the environment if resolution is to occur. The child will need to receive medication that binds with the lead and increases the rate of excretion from the body. Sodium, calcium disodium editate, dimercopol, and sexamere are all medications that you can see utilized for a child who might needs chelation therapy when their lab level is 45 micrograms per deciliter. For children that have um, over 70 micrograms per deciliter, um, immediately they need to provide coordination of care and clinical management, treatment, environmental investigation, and lead hazard control. Again, this child cannot stay in the environment if the resolution is to occur. The child will receive medication that binds with the lead and increases the rate of excretion from the body. So the, again, the calcium disodium editate and succimere um, are often uh, used together. They're the most consistent agents used. Um, succimere can be given orally. Um, they can swallow the tablet whole or you can sprinkle it onto, onto food. Dimercoprol dim, um, and the calcium, di, calci, calcium disodium editate is frequently used for levels of 70 micrograms per deciliter or more. Do not give dimercoprol to um, children that have G6PD deficiency, a peanut allergy, or in conjunction with iron. Some side effects of the calcium disodium editate are nephrotoxicity, nausea and vomiting, elevated liver enzymes, and paresthesia. <coughs> As a nurse, you can use amla cream for one hour before the deep IM injection, and you can apply it two and a half hours when using the dimercopol and the calcium disodium editate if they're used together. 
note they do need to have an adequate urine output, so monitoring intake and output is crucial. Teach the parents to cheat, feed a child high in iron and ca a high calcium diet because lead can actually interfere with the calcium and vitamin D metabolism. Also remember that um, the iron can affect the central nervous systems, the blood cells, and kidney functions. How can we reduce blood levels? There is again a table in your textbook. Make certain children don't have access to peeling paint or chewable surfaces that are painted with lead-based paint, especially window sills and wells. If a house was built before 1978 and has hard surface floors, wet mop them at least once per week. Wipe other hard surfaces. If there are loose paint chips in an area, such as the window well, Use a wet disposable cloth to pick them up and discard them. Do not vacuum hard surface floors or window sills because this can spread dust. Only use vacuum cleaners with agitators to remove dust from the rugs rather than the vacuum cleaners with suction only. If a rug is known to contain lead dust and cannot be washed, it should be discarded. Wash and dry children's hands and faces frequently, especially before eating. Also wash toys and pacifiers frequently. Wipe your feet on mats before entering the home, especially if you work in occupations where lead is used. Removing your shoes when you're entering the house is also good practice to control lead. If soil around the home is or is likely to be contaminated with lead, um, so this would be the case if the home is built before 1978 or is near a major highway, plant grass or other ground cover um, or bushes so that the child cannot play in that area. During remodeling of older homes, follow correct procedures. Be certain that children of pregnant women are not in the home day or night until the process is complete. After deleting the area, thoroughly clean the house using cleaning solutions to a damp moth and dust before uh, children um, and pregnant women return. In areas where lead content of water exceeds the drinking water standards and a particular water faucet has not been used for more than six hours or more, uh, flush the cold water pipes by running the water until it becomes as cold it will, as it will get anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes. The more time the water has been sitting in the pipe, the more lead it may contain. Only use cold water from, for consumption, drinking, cooking, and especially for reconstituting uh, powdered infant formula. Hot water dissolves lead more quickly than cold water and thus contains higher lead levels. It is acceptable to use first flush water for non-consumption, like bathing. Have water tested by a competent laboratory. This action is especially important for apartment dwellers. Flushing may not be effective in high-rise buildings and in other buildings with lead-soldered central piping. Do not store food in open cans, particularly if the cans are imported. Do not use pottery ceramic ware that was inadequately fired or is meant for decorative use only for uh, so also do not use uh, things that are for decorative use or food storage. Do not store drinks or food in lead crystal. Avoid folk remedies or cosmetics that contain lead. Avoid uh, candy imported from Mexico, like the tamarind hard candy that's been found to have lead. Avoid imported toys and toy jewelry that may contain lead. Make certain that home exposure is not occurring from parental occupations or hobbies. Household members may uh, employed in occupations such as lead smelting um, areas should shower um, and change into clean clothes before leaving work. Construction and lead abatement workers may also bring home uh, lead contaminants, so it's important for them to uh, clean up before they come into the house. Ensure the children eat regular meals before uh, because uh, more lead is absorbed into the body when the stomach is empty. Ensure that the child's diet contains sufficient iron and calcium and it is not excessive in fat. Consider iron supplementation if the child does not regularly consume foods that are rich in iron. Lastly, we're going to talk about child maltreatment. This is basically any intentional act of physical abuse and neglect, emotional abuse and neglect, 
or sexual abuse. Infants and toddlers are the most common victims of physical abuse. 50% of reported neglect cases are five years old and under. 79% of child maltreatment was neglect. School age and adolescents are at higher risk for emotional abuse. Types of abuse and neglect, physical abuse. Uh, this is the intentional infliction of physical injury, punching, beating, biting, kicking, burning, shaking, or anything that harms the child. Uh, there is something also called Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is a person who induces or fabricates an illness in another. It is most often by the mother in children to gain attention from medical staff or increase their self-esteem. Warning signs include unexplained, prolonged, recurrent, or extremely rare illnesses, discrepancies between the exam and the history, illnesses that are not responses to therapy, signs and symptoms only occur when the person is there. Uh, the parent tends to be very about the illness. The parent is very interested in interacting with the healthcare team. The parent is very attentive towards the child. They wish to leave the child alone. Family members also may have other symptoms as well. These kids unfortunately undergo unnecessary and painful diagnostic tests and treatments. Intense. They can accept the sick story. They might believe that they are actually sick and then they can even develop this as an adult as a disorder. Abusive head trauma, also called shaken baby syndrome. Please note, not all abuse has symptoms that are out of the body. That said, shaking a baby can cause intracranial trauma without external signs of injury. Nurses should suspect, expect this or suspect this in infants younger than a year of age who have subdural hematomas or and retinal hemorrhages in the absence of external signs of trauma. So if you see subdural hematomas or retinal hemorrhages and you don't have any other kinds of trauma on the head, this would be something that would be, we would be expecting. Additional signs are failure to thrive, seizures, coma, respiratory irregularities, apnea, vomiting can be seen with an, uh, uh, a change in the level of consciousness. Um, their level of consciousness can go from being drowsy to lethargic. So please never shake a baby to wake them up. When you're burping the baby, don't let their head be going back and forth. So we don't want the head to um, shake in with vigor. Um, and also never shake a baby when they're angry. Um, don't even toss an infant up in the air to be playful. We need to be very careful with their little heads. Physical neglect. This is the deprivation of necessities, so the failure to provide the physical or educational needs like food, shelter, clothing, supervision, or health care. Emotional or psychological neglect. This is when a caretaker is emotionally unavailable, cold and uncaring towards a child. They don't give the child the personal affection that they need, the nurturing, or the attention that children need. Emotional or psychological abuse, this is the deliberate, deliberate attempt to destroy or impair a child's self-esteem or their competence by rejecting them, isolating them, terrorizing, ignoring, corrupting them, verbally assaulting them, and overpressuring a child. Sexual abuse includes the use, persuasion, or coercion to engage in sexually explicit conduct. Uh, this would include, but isn't limited to, fondling, incest, rape, intercourse, sodomy, exhibitionism, exploitation through prostitution or production of pornography, and oral, oral genital sex. Factors that predispose a child to abuse. Uh, basically, the factors include the parent, the child, and environmental characteristics. So, Parental characteristics include, um, although physical punishments tend to occur in abusive parents, many parents were not abused as a child. The thing is, is if a parent was severely abused as a child, they are more likely to injure the child. 
Um, often they have difficulty controlling aggressive impulses. They have a free expression of violence, socially isolated, low self-esteem, less than adequate maternal paternal functioning. They may have issues with drug addiction, marriage problems, little knowledge of appropriate parenting skills, and they may even have an unrealistic expectation for the child's age. The child's characteristics. A child can actually unintentionally contribute to an abuse situation from birth to age. Are its temperament, like the physically disabled, brain damage, illegitimate, maybe they are unwanted, um, also can have be at increased risk for abuse. A premature child, um, because they was there was decreased bonding uh, when they were born, maybe if they were in the NICU, and also a difficult pregnancy can pre predispose a child to being abused. Environmental characteristics. Typically, the environment is one of chronic stress, including divorce, poverty, unemployment, isolation, and few friends. Remember, this can occur in all areas regard of race and socioeconomic status. Uh, families that use caregivers and daycare may be at risk if they are not well vetted. So, warning signs of abuse. There's physical evidence of abuse and or neglect, including previous injuries. There's conflicting stories about the accident or injury from parents or others. They say that the injury is because of their sibling or someone else. An injury that is inconsistent with the history, such as a concussion and a broken arm bed. A history that is inconsistent with a child's developmental level, such as a six-month-old turning on a hot water faucet. A complaint other than the one that is associated with the signs of abuse. So the family comes into the emergency room because a child has a cold, but there is evidence of a first or second degree burn on the hands. Inappropriate response of the caregiver, such as an exaggerated or absent emotional response. Refusal to sign for additional tests or agree to necessary treatment, or if we see an excessive delay in seeking treatment, or there's an absence of the parents for questioning. Those all are red flags. Inappropriate response of the child, such as little or no response to pain, or if they have a fear of being touched. Um, also, excessive or lack of separation anxiety or indiscriminate friendliness to strangers. Uh, the child reports physical or sexual abuse. Is there a previous report of abuse in the family? Do they go to the emergency room frequently with injuries? Incompatibility between the history and the injury is probably the most important criteria of which to base the decision to report damages in a child without external signs of trauma can be an indication of that shaken baby syndrome. So physical neglect, suggestive physical findings would include growth failure, signs of malnutrition, such as thin extremities, abdominal distension, lack of subcutaneous fat, poor personal hygiene, unclean or inappropriate dress, evidence of poor health, such as delayed immunizations, untreated infections, frequent colds, frequent injuries from a lack of supervision, uh, dull inactive affect, um, excessively passive or sleepy, um, self-stimulatory behaviors such as finger sucking or rocking, um, begging or stealing for food, absenteeism from school, substance abuse, vandalism, or shoplifting. These are the behaviors you would see with emotional um, with the here, the physical things we uh, would be things like growth failure, eating or feeding disorders, enuresis, sleep disorders, and then the behaviors you could see, again, those self-stimulatory behaviors such as biting, rocking, or sucking. During infancy, you may see a lack of a social smile and stranger anxiety. They, withdraw, they may withdraw from the environment and people. 
unusual fearfulness. Uh, you may also see antisocial behavior such as destructiveness, stealing, cruelty to animals or people. You can see extremes of behavior such as overcompliance and passive or aggressive and demanding. They lack like an emotional and intellectual development, especially language, and then you can even see suicide attempts. So physical abuse, what are the physical findings that we see here? Bruises and welts, the welts that can be in various stages of healing. Uh, these can be any place, so uh, the face, lips, mouth, back, buttocks, anywhere at all. Uh, you can see regular patterns of descript descriptive objects that are used, like a belt, a hand, a wire hanger, a wooden spoon, um, pinch marks. Uh, these can be in various stages of healing. Burns, they can be on the bottom of the feet or the soles of the, um, the soles of the hands or the, uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon, the soles of the feet or the palms of the hands. You can also see this on the backs or the buttocks. Uh, patterns descriptive of an object used could be very round like a cigar or a cigarette burn. Um, you could see uh, uh, very specific demarcations uh, if their hand or foot or their bottom was placed in scalding water. Um, you could see rope burns on wrist or ankles if they were bound. Um, you could see burns in the shape of an iron, radiator, or electric stove burner. Um, absence of a splash mark in the presence of symmetric burns, definitely something you need to pay attention to. Also, stun gun injuries. These lesions are circular and fairly uniform, and they're paired about five centimeters apart. Fractures and dislocations. Here you could see skull, nose, or facial fractures. The injury denoting the type of abuse such as a spiral fracture or a dislocation from twisting of an extremity or whiplash from shaking a child. Uh, multiple new or old fractures in various stages of healing. Also, again, red flags. Lacerations and abrasions on the backs of arms, legs, torso, face, or external genitalia. Unusual symptoms such as, such as abdominal swelling pain and vomiting from punching. Descriptive marks such as from human bites or pulling out of hair. Um, chemicals, unexplained repeated poisoning, especially drug overdose. Um, unexplained illnesses such as hypoglycemia from admi insulin administration. A suggestive behaviors that we would see with the physical abuse. They may be wary of physical contact with adults. They have an apparent fear of parents or going home. They may lie very still while surveying the environment. They may have an inappropriate reaction to an injury such as a failure to cry from pain. They lack reaction to frightening events. Uh, they may be apprehensive when hearing other children cry. They have indiscriminate friendliness and displays of affection. They demonstrate superficial relationships. They may have acting out behaviors such as aggression to seek attention. They also can have withdrawal behavior. Sexual abuse. Suggested physical findings include bruising, bleeding, laceration, or irritation of the external genitalia, anus, mouth, or throat, torn, stained, or bloody underclothing, pain on urination or pain, swelling, and itching of the genitalia, penile discharge, sexually transmitted disease, nonspecific vaginitis, difficulty in walking or sitting, unusual order in the genital area, recurrent urinary tract infections, presence of sperm, pregnancy in the very young adolescent. Suggestive behaviors here, sudden emergence of sexually related problems, including excessive or public masturbation uh, in an age inappropriate child, sexual play, promiscuity, or overtly seductive behavior, withdrawn behavior, excessive daydreaming, preoccupation with fantasies, especially in play, poor relationships with peers, sudden changes such as anxiety, loss or gain of weight, clinging behavior, in incestuous relationships, excessive anger at the mother for not protecting the daughter, and it also could be the son, regressive behaviors such as bedwetting or thumb sucking, a sudden onset of phobias or fears, particularly fears in the dark, men strangers, or particular settings or situations. Undue fear of leaving the house or staying at a daycare center or at the babysitter's house. Running away from home. 
substance abuse, particularly of alcohol or mood elevating drugs, profound and rapid personality changes, especially extreme de depression, hospitality, and aggression are often accompanied by social withdrawal. Rapidly declining school performance and suicidal thoughts and attempts. Nursing care. You want to meet the child's physical and psychological needs first. Do not interrogate them by asking too many questions. Be specific and factual with all documentation regarding the physical condition and behavioral wants response towards others. Do not examine the child alone. Take photographs as allowed. Refer to social services so that the family can get counseling for abuse cessation. Parenting classes, family therapy, and support groups may be necessary. Teach the parents child developmental principles and serve as their role model. Let the child know that they did nothing wrong. As a nurse, you must legally report child abuse if you suspect it is occurring. Remember, I didn't say if you have absolute certainty. You must report child abuse if it is even a suspicion. Observe child and parent interactions. Although it's very difficult as a nurse, it is important for you to remain non-judgmental. Nursing care guidelines. So here, let's take a look at the history of the injury. Let's look at the date, time, and place of occurrence. We want to have a sequence of the events with recorded times. Is there a presence of witnesses, especially the person caring for the child at the time of the incidents? What is the time lapse between the occurrence of the injury and the initiation of treatment? Interview with the Interview with the child when appropriate, including verbal quotations and information from drawing and other play activities. Interview with the parent, witnesses, and other significant persons, including verbal quotations. A description of the parent-child interactions, including verbal interactions, eye contact, touching, and parental concern are all appropriate. And then you should also have the name and age and condition of other children in the home. Physical examination. You need to document the location, size, and shape, and color of the bruises, the approximate location, size, and shape on a drawing of a body outline. Any distinguishing characteristics, such as a bruise in the shape of a hand or a round burn, possibly caused by a cigarette or cigar. Symmetry or asymmetry of an injury, presence of other injuries, the degree of pain or any bone tenderness, evidence of past injuries, the general state of health and hygiene, and the developmental level of the child and a screening test. Preventing or dealing with sexual abuse of children. Sexual assault of children is much more common than people realize. It may be preventable if children have good preparation. To provide protection and preparation, pay careful attention to who is around the child. Unwanted touch can come from someone liked and trusted. Back up a child's right to say no. Encourage communication by taking seriously what the child says. Take a second look at signals of potential danger. Refuse to leave the child in the company of those not trusted. Include information about sexual assault when teaching about safety. Provide specific definitions and examples of sexual assault. Remind children that even, quote, nice people sometimes do mean things. Urge children to tell anybody who is causing them to be uncomfortable. Tell the parents. Prepare children to deal with bribes and threats as well as possible physical force. Virtual, el virtually eliminate any sequence between children and parents. Tell children they can tell you anything. Sexual abusers may pressure children into secrecy. Teach children how to say no, ask for help, and control who touches them and how. Model self-protective and self-limiting behavior. Um, teach children how to set limits. Should it ever become necessary to help a child recover from sexual assault, it's important to listen carefully and understand the child. Support the child for telling the truth and praise the child, believe the child, provide them with sympathy, sympathy and do not blame them. Know the local resources and choose help carefully. Provide opportunities to talk about assault. Provide opportunities for the entire family to go through a recovery process.
Sexual assault affects everyone. To help deal with the social problem, provide sympathetic care and support to those have been who have been victimized. Recognize that offenders do not change without intervention. Organize neighborhood programs to support each other's efforts to protect children. Encourage schools to provide information about sexual support, uh, sexual assault as a problem of health and safety. Teach stranger safety. So let them know. Uh, do not ever go with a stranger. Avoid personalized clothing in public places. Tell parents if anyone, if a child, uh, if somebody is making the child feel com uncomfortable in any kind of way. Always listen to a child's concern regarding others' behaviors. Teach the children to do anything necessary to get away from a stranger if somebody is trying to take them. And then organize community groups to support educational treatment and law enforcement. Lastly, we will be talking about the vaccines and vaccine schedule. Please note that here is the website for the most up-to-date vaccine schedule. Uh, please write this down. I'll give you a moment to do that. Um, and uh, please download it. This must be memorized for exams. Um, so let me stop speaking for a moment and let you write this down. Okay, so when we're thinking about vaccines, remember we do need to have informed consent. Parents, and part of this informed consent, parent must be given the proper current vaccine information statements prior to the administration of the vaccine. Uh, so please make sure you've checked the date on the vaccine information statement. Uh, sometimes you might see this abbreviated as a VIS sheet. Uh, and make sure it is the most current one. They also uh, can choose to opt out of the CARES registry. This is a registry that helps to let people know which vaccines a child has had. Um, in general, uh, unless the parent signs to opt out, children's vaccine records are automatically inputted. So different kinds of vaccines. A killed virus vaccine, this contains a killed microorganism that can still cause uh, a person to make an antibody against it. An example of this is IPV. A toxoid is a toxin heat or chemically treated to weaken its effect, but it can still cause a person to make antibodies. An example of this is tetanus. Live virus vaccines, uh, a, micro, a microorganism is alive but it's attenuated or weakened. An example of this would be measles, varicella, oral poliovirus, which isn't something we use in the United States, but they may use elsewhere. And then the live attenuated influenza vaccine. This is the flumus. This is the one that you inhale. So this is the vaccine that is inhaled. Um, know that this is okay for non-pregnant people um, who are two to 49 years of age. And then rotavirus is also a live virus vaccines. In general, we say live virus vaccines are contraindicated in people that are immunocompromised. Remember, it is best to keep infectious children at home. Also, if the person is HIV positive and they are healthy, there may be some uh, exceptions to the no live virus vaccines. Uh, so please speak with their physician. Also at LA County Hospital, siblings of uh, children that have cancer and they are on active chemotherapy, uh, they may postpone uh, their live virus vaccines as well. What are some contraindications for the vaccines? Um, all vaccines, uh, an absolute contraindication would be if somebody had an anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine, um, then you would not give that again. Um, the Tdap or the T. Uh, uh, Tdap basically is what we use. Contraindications here is encephalopathy within seven days of the dose. 
uh, precautions include a fever greater than uh, 40.5 Celsius or 105 Fahrenheit within 48 hours of its administration, a collapse or shock light state within 48 hours of, admission, of administration. If they had seizures within three days of receiving the dose, uh, persistent and inco inconsolable crying um, that lasts longer than 43 um, hours within a 48 hour period. Again, we don't give the oral polio virus uh, in the U.S., but I'd like to talk just uh, uh, briefly about it, just because it is given elsewhere. Um, so if you hear of somebody getting this, um, you would not give this to somebody that is uh, uh, immunodeficient. IPV, the inactivated polyovirus. Here, uh, an absolute contraindication is if they have an anaphylactic reaction to neomycin or streptomycin. MMR, here, if they are pregnant, uh, also if they've had an anaphylaxis after eating gelatin, that is problematic. So here are some precautions. Um, if they received an immunoglobulin, uh, please note that uh, you don't give IV, IG, and an MMR at the same time. Um, if for some reason it's absolutely unavoidable, you would give this at different sites and then revaccinate or test for seroconversion in three months. If immunoglobulin is given first, you should not give the MMR for at least three to six months. I've even seen it as long as 11 months. Um, if the MMR is given first, then IVIG ideally should not be given for at least two weeks. The hepatitis B vaccine, here absolute contraindications, is an anaphylactic reaction to common baker's yeast. Varicella, here contraindications would include immunocompromised individuals, pregnancy, corticosteroid use, or anaphylaxis after eating gelatin. Pneumococcal, typically we don't want to give this if they are moderately or severely ill with or without a fever. Influenza, if they have a febrile illness, uh, uh, issues with thimerosal, if they have a history with Guillain-Barre, and egg allergies, here it kind of depends on the medication that they're going to be getting. So if the child has an egg allergy, as a nurse you want to uh, bring this to the physician's attention. This concludes part B of the week two lecture, um, ad addressing uh, the content for week two. But remember, this is part B. Please be sure to read your textbook and complete the assignments for this week to facilitate the utilization of the content and applying it to the nursing process. Thanks a lot and have a good day. Bye-bye.